Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today for another one of Simania Clinic's talks. We've got a very interesting discussion that I'm so excited to share with everyone. We're going to be looking at a contemplative approach to healthcare and the benefits of integrative health. So the WHO actually defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely an absence of disease or infirmity. So again, key emphasis, WHO defines health or encompasses health as a synchrony within and between individuals, looking specifically at physical and mental conditions, personal experience, and one's social condition. Thus, health implies a state of interconnectedness. Health represents the integration of the physical, mental, spiritual well-being within an individual who is also part of the collective as well as being a part of the social whole. So what do we mean by contemplative practice? What are common forms of contemplative practice? A contemplative practice can include practices such as meditation, mindfulness, tai chi, yoga, and prayer. Contemplative practice does not necessarily have to be attached to a religious practice, but rather a mindful practice. So let's explore those thoughts a little bit further. Mindfulness and meditation. So meditation practice really cultivates a present moment, a present awareness. Meditation practice includes mindfulness, and it has come to neuroscientists' attention after thorough investigation that consciousness can affect the regulation of one's mental training. Sorry, we're just having a break in the connection. One moment. So if we look then at the relationship between medicine and mindfulness, we know that the human capacity is really proposed to foster a clear thinking and open-heartedness. The goal of mindfulness is to maintain awareness in each and every moment disengaging oneself from a strong attachment or belief or thoughts or emotions, thereby developing a great sense of emotional balance and well-being. The original purpose of mindfulness is really to alleviate suffering and cultivate compassion. And this mindfulness can then be used as a practice between medical patients and medical practitioners. Further to this, particularly in diseases of lifestyle that are exacerbated by modifiable lifestyle factors and lifestyle modifications can constitute a primary or an auxiliary treatment for medical conditions. So we can really then use mindfulness as a participatory practice because it has a great responsibility in terms of one's choices that they make and it really engages in strengthening an individual's resources in terms of recovering from disease or illness. So some studies that have been done has actually reviewed the neurophysiology of mindfulness, and they've done this by looking at EEG oscillations. What is interesting about this particular paper is that it's a systematic review that has looked at over 56 papers worldwide and has studied over 1,715 patients. And what they have found in this particular review is that mindfulness can increase both the alpha and the theta wave. And this signifies a state of relaxed alertness. So mindfulness plays a major role in the impact that it can have on the brain. 
Mindfulness and the use of it during COVID-19 uh, is their potential role for telemedicine. Uh, we know that there's been a recent study that's looked at over 200 patients that had chronic pain, and they actually utilized mindfulness, but electronically, and they found that it definitely did have an impact on these patients. So for this interesting discussion today, we have our facilitator as always, Dr. Mariba Libeko, who will facilitate the conversation. We have Heidi Smith. She is very well versant with contemplative practices. She is an evolved NLP practitioner, coach and stylist. She is really interested in fulfilling her purpose. She has two decades of professional experience in retail and the manufacturing industry. He has accumulated a wealth of knowledge. And further to this, she studied clothing management at CPUT and completed a six month exchange program in Amsterdam and an internship in London. Our second speaker today is actually Nefriti Jade. She has a decade of experience. Nefriti is a well-recognized integrative functional wellness expert and a visionary that's committed to cultivating prosperity in previously impoverished environments while supporting social justice and environmental stability and sustainability. Nefriti's on the ground work coupled with her rich experience of life is cultivated by her deep empathy and understanding of the social applique of the world and the historical landscape. Nefriti is on a journey to enhance over a million women in Africa. She, she really wants to assist these women over the next five year period. Her key focus is in agriculture, art and integrative functional wellness. Nefriti is a leading authority in mind-body medicine. She is a world-renowned neuro-linguistic trainer, functional wellness educator, diagnostic microscopist, an integrative nutritionist, an acupuncturist, a mind-body medicine expert, a conscious leader. Thank you so much for being with us today and for being a part of this conversation. We thank you. Over to you, Nefriti. Thank you so much, Kim, for having myself and Heidi here today to share with you guys a little bit about what we've learned over the many, many, many years of uh, studies and uh, life experience. Um, mm. I think before we get into it, what I want to do, and please forgive me, I'm just like jumping straight into it because I'm aware of the time. And what I want to do is actually get as much information across to whoever is watching or listening. Uh, so that you can go and research stuff for yourself and kind of understand the, the, the profound connection between the mind and the body and how our thoughts, our, our, um, our um, thoughts about ourselves, our thoughts about our environment, our thoughts about our community, how all of that has a direct impact on the body. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're going to go directly into meditation because that was one of the things on Kim's um, notes am i correct kim so just before we even get into it i want to like totally bu burst the myth if that's a way to say it i want to get rid of i want to eradicate the myth behind meditation because i mean we've been conditioned by social media we've been conditioned by hollywood we've been conditioned by cartoons so the mm -hmm. conventional thinking around meditation is someone sitting on a mat with legs crossed in a position trying to clear their mind it's absolutely not that. Um, it's part of that in some way, but it's much, much more than that. Um, and just so that you understand uh, how I got here and, and why I do this, I was diagnosed with shock-induced diabetes when I was 21. Um, it was, um, I'm just gonna be like totally brutal and out there. <laughs> it was after my dad was murdered and I had found out two months after that that my wonderful life partner <laughs> was um i don't know i think he was just in an experimental state and um he he kind of there was an infidelity put it that way 
And so as you would imagine, as a young woman, I was like mortified. I had self-confidence issues. And then my and then with the shock of my dad's murder, I was like just in a really bad headspace. I ended up in hospital with um, depression, insomnia, shock-induced diabetes, blah de blah. And I had this kind of weird contemplative moment, <laughs> mindful moment, where I looked through the window and I saw the sun streaking in. And I kind of said to myself, this is totally not what life is meant to be about. You know, I feel like I'm in so much of pain with everything that's going on. What can I do to just shift this? Because because really, it just the, the diagnosis can't be the last diagnosis, put it that way. Um, and well, mm -hmm. my wonderful life partner at the time, who was so sorry for what he had done, uh, was like just there to support me in every single way that he could. And so for the next decade, I proceeded to develop myself, become more self-aware, uh, aware of how my thoughts influenced me, aware of um, how, I don't know, how everything, how my conditioning, my, my, my life with my family, how that influenced me, all of those things. So it was a huge journey. I was, I studied with, um, well, I traveled to various places. Um, Anthony Robbins, I'm sure everybody knows him. He's the, the funny guy, you know, the tall guy with the big smile. And um, he's all about mind power and he wants to know what drives human behavior. So I thought, okay, my, Tony Robbins would be a good person to follow. So I went, um, you know, read his books, did his online programs, eventually decided that I wanted to go and see him um live and attend these events did that past the mind barrier fire walked with him all of those things and it was and it was all amazing so my biggest mm. uh, learning is kind of learning of self and being contemplative in the way that we go about life in in in, in that we want to be driven by the thing inside us that fools us and that makes us happy and if we have bad thoughts, and I'm saying this in a basic way, and I know this is an academic show and then probably lots of doctors listening or that will see it, but I want to break this down simply because I wanted to reach the communities and I wanted to reach people everywhere. The way we are feeling our thinking, mm -hmm. even sickness, what is health? We don't even, I mean, health, if you think about the word health, what is health? Health is the absence of disease, right? That's how we program to understand yeah. it. Health is actually wholeness. Health is, 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 is wholeness. So how do we become whole? I mean, there's just so much to talk about in this <laughs> such a little time. So with mm -hmm. that said, coming back to the whole thing that I started with in terms of meditation, meditation is not that thing that you go like, mm, and, you know, chant. And it's, yes, it's part of all of that. And that will help you to, to realize deeper levels of interconnectedness, if that's what you, how you want to label it. But I think... The most important thing is being mindful in everything you do from the thing you put into your mouth that is going to nourish your body to the programs you watch on television that is going to influence your mind uh, to the way that you talk to yourself, your self-talk. Like even here's a trick, here's a cool, cool trick, right? Just to prove the whole thing. Um, if I tell you right now, whatever you do, don't think about a pink elephant. What are you going to do? You're going to think about a pink elephant. How often do we tell each other? ourselves like even when we are sick not to be sick or how I, I had COVID in um december and i'm the person that needs to walk like 10 k's a day for my um for me to but that's my meditative space that's how i do meditation i walk in nature and and that's what i do and after COVID, i had this long COVID syndrome thing that um where i couldn't i was just completely fatigued and all of those things and I found myself, even with everything that I know and all the learning that I've done, I found myself one day walking and being angry with myself for not being able to go further. And, and, mm. and the next day when I like got into a more mindful space, I realized that, that the way that we talk to ourselves has an effect, and I need to be practicing this more than I'm teaching it right now because that's when we know health, right? When we are in a state of dis-ease in the body, that's when we know health its best. So mm -hmm. what I did was I started talking to myself better. I started saying, every time I felt tired, I would say to myself, well, I'm so grateful to my legs for carrying me this far, for getting me to walk this much. And tomorrow's gonna be 
a wonderful day and I'm probably going to walk a little bit further. And that actually within three days, I was walking further. So I went from, because I got COVID in Cape Town and then I was locked down and I just spent like six weeks there and oh, it was, mm -hmm. and I was wanting to come back home to Johannesburg. So when I came here, I loved the trees, loved to walk and I couldn't walk. It was like hectic. But just after three days of changing my stuff, I realized, oh my gosh, this has a direct impact on my body. And it was just a reminder. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we can forget. Anyway, I'm talking a lot. I'm going to cross over to Heidi. Because I want this to be conversational, so we all learn. <laughs> so, hi. There we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, Nikki, I just want to touch on, all, um, I'll just give you guys all a brief, just a brief introduction to myself. So, I came into the, the NLP and coaching space in, uh, somehow it seems there's always an event that starts these proceedings. So, in 2017, mm. um, my partner's company went into liquidation and I had been working with Nikki previously from a health perspective um, as medical doctors weren't able to help me with um like a problem that I had. Anyway, I went to Nikki and I worked with her. And then in after our company was liquidated, I studied NLP with Nick, Nikki. And that's how my, my NLP journey and coaching journey started. So that's a, a brief, brief synopsis mm. of uh, my journey into the coaching and um, space. But Nikki, what I wanted to say is that there's a saying that goes, what your mind thinks, your body believes. So whatever you mm. think, well, for yourself, your body's going to believe it. And what I want to, um, and Kim, you or Dr. Lamont, <laughs> you touched on COVID and the effects of COVID. And I, this is a journey that I would like to share with your, your listeners or viewers. Um, obviously, last year with COVID, I, it was, I found it to be quite traumatic. Unfortunately, I haven't contracted COVID yet, but from a mental point of view, it affected me really, really dramatically to such an extent that I'd actually developed anxiety, which I'd never, ever experienced before. Um, and as a coach, I actually had to start questioning myself in terms of where is this coming from? What is driving the anxiety? What is, and I, the one evening after the heavy lockdown, I'd come back to Cape Town to see my parents um, because my parents, uh, my, my mom, oh, my dad had just been diagnosed with diabetes and I just needed to see that he was okay. Um, and I came back and I could just feel my chest was like tightening and I was like, oh no. And I actually had to sit down and I, I said, I just coached myself and I thought, Heidi, what is driving you to feel this? And I, after about 10, 10 minutes to 15 minutes, I actually realized that it was fear. So there's always a root cause for, for what, what drives our fear but anyway last year's process at the beginning of this year I had an experience where I thought to myself I'm not I don't have COVID by putting myself through this whole thought process all the time I'm experiencing it twice so it's actually like I'm having it like I'm actually experiencing mm. and there's actually the Buddhists call this the second arrow of suffering so because in your mind, you're fearful and thinking about it all the time. You actually, your body really experiences all of that, even though it's actually not real because it's a perceived, it's a perceived situation. It's not like you're actually going through it. So that's why mindfulness is so important mm -hmm. because it's about being mindful of your thoughts. And, and it's, as what Nikki said, it's about being mindful of how you speak to yourself, of how you speak to others, because your words have power. Um, and that's that's what integrative medicine is mm. all about. It's about being mindful. It's about for, you know, there's in, in some of the research I was doing, for example, in Australia and in the US, they're actually with doctors practicing as doctors, they teach them mindfulness because it actually allows mm. them to be better doctors because they're able to become more empathetic because they're able to also look after themselves. And if they can look after themselves, they're able to look after their patients in a better way. So, you know, before, you know, Western medicine and sort of integrative medicine has always been two separate spheres where the way the world is moving now, we're starting to integrate Western medicine with integrative medicine, and they both play a part, and they, they're both able to help each other and patients or clients that you're working with from either perspective. So 
yeah, I, I think I think mindfulness is such a, a powerful powerful tool and there's also different types of medi med medication meditation um, in terms of where you get your focus meditation and your open-minded meditation so as you kind of progress through this there's there's different phases in terms of like exercising your body meditation is consciously exercising your mind in terms of how you think how you perceive things how you purposefully do things. And it's mm -hmm. it's what Nikki was talking about. It's, it's not just about your words, but it's also about how you feed your body, mm -hmm. what are you putting into your body. Um, so mm -hmm. it's a, I have a, a huge passion for this. Like really, um, yeah. on, on, on Friday, I'm sorry, I'm sharing, you know, it's always easier to speak from your own perspective. And it's something that mm -hmm. I was actually speaking to Nikki about. On Friday, I had to, go for a biopsy because they found a, a growth on my thyroid and um, I was quite nervous but it's been such an amazing change in myself where before I would have been stressing all the time but because of the conscious decision that I made at the beginning of the year that I would not experience things twice so until something is confirmed or said I'm not going to worry about it obviously when I got to the hospital and I had to go for the procedure the doctor's like are you okay explaining everything mm -hmm. and I just said to him I'm actually scared um, you know just tell me exactly what's going on and then while I was doing that obviously I, I'm able to go into a meditative state and I just close my eyes and you kind of can zoom out or just focus in the moment and mm. while I was actually I actually thought it was such a beautiful experience because I was thinking what happens if other patients are taught these techniques who are going through procedures in hospital that where they they're able to speak to somebody before a procedure or speak to somebody when they're going through something about you can actually coach them from a mindfulness point of view um it, it's such a, a beautiful integration and this this I was all thinking about while I was lying on that that the bed, you know, having a needle stuck into my in my neck. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think for me, if I, if I can jump in here, Heidi, and either you or Nefreti can comment. But one of the key things that I'm picking up is that you have to learn the necessary tools to filter your reality. So you've experienced a loss or you've experienced depression or anxiety or shock-induced diabetes. And yes, this takes a physical strain on the body. But how do you now filter this reality so that you can utilize mindfulness so that you can sort of rebalance or reposition yourself? How do you go about that? Yay, I got the answer. Changing lanes, Africa. <laughs> That's how you do. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put it out there. What what you need to do, you can Google, you can research, but what I've developed quite recently, um, so I've been teaching neurolinguistics to corporates for, for many, many years. I run trainings, but I realized that the people that need it are really not I mean, not everyone just has a few thousand rands lying around to go on a course, right? Let's be honest about that. A few tens of thousands mm -hmm. of rands. So Changing Lanes runs a workshop, a two-day um, integrative self-awareness workshop. And what we d dish out, dice up in that workshop is the process of reality creation. So for those of you that probably won't come on the course, Google it. What is NLP model of uh, process of reality creation? If you understand that, you will shift. Um, mm -hmm. If you have the op opportunity to come two days, it will absolutely, two half days, it will absolutely change your life. And it is, it's kind of for free. You, I mean, you literally pay the cost of, the, of, of what it is to run the thing because this is such invaluable mm -hmm. information. Um, in fact, if you go to the Changing Lens Facebook page and you do a, what, what do they call it? A personal message or pro mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. um, I can send you some information, just like a, a one pager that you can read through and try to understand it. But it is, or get yourself a coach, get yourself an NLP coach, because your NLP coach, like, you know, if there's anything in life you want to be good at, right? You, what do you do? You want to learn, you, you kind of, I mean, for me, I'm speaking for me. I want to learn the strategy. I want to learn the strategy from the best person because I want to excel at it, right? So there's lots of, there are many wonderful 
coaches and, and people there that, that are there to support you and give you the tools that will help you understand. But for the moment, I would say the most basic and simple thing to do, go buy a book at Exclusive Books or go and Google NLP um, Process of Reality Creation. <laughs> Heidi, what, what would you suggest? Yeah, that's the thing is it's about it's about finding somebody you can work with. It's about, you know, they, they always say, and when we study NLP is go to somebody who is better than you at something and learn from them. Because if mm -hmm. you, if you it's, it's called the, Nikki, I've forgotten, performance of excellence. Um, I've forgotten the word now. But if you, if you want to be excellent at something you do, you work with somebody who's already excellent at it because then you can, you learn from them. So about, and it's about, you know, Kim, it does, it's not something that happens overnight. It's a, it's mm. a process. I mean, I'm, I'm 44 this year and I haven't always thought like this, but because you're open-minded and, you know, we don't all know everything. I, for mm. example, I've never ever experienced anxiety before in my life until to last year and fortunately for me I've been able to work through it but by understanding who I am as a person um, and I think I've only been able to do that because I'm a coach myself so you actually have to sit down and talk hardly to yourself like where is this coming from what am I doing why am I thinking like this but mm. it's also it's also a process in terms of you can only do what you or the thing is that you can only do what you know currently. So if you don't know any better, you can't improve your current situation. So go to an expert to help you. So either find mm -hmm. a coach or go to do a program like Changing Lanes or get a book. Mm -hmm. um, start with a book. And there's so many groups that you, that you can reach out to on Facebook or on Instagram and ask the questions. Just start the conversation. Take that step. It's about mm -hmm. taking that one step. It's not about climbing the whole ladder in one go, but, but mm -hmm. about being brave enough to, to take that first step to self-development. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, you know, everybody, you know, when you're looking at something from the outside and you're seeing somebody else, it's always like, oh, you know, it's happened so quickly, but it, it's not it's not like that. It's, it's really a process of self-development. Mm -hmm. Get somebody to Thank help you. Yeah, yeah no Definitely. Thank you so much, Heidi. I think it's definitely one taking responsibility for what they think about and really processing that so that you can divert it, well, digest it and then divert it in a way that is, is best suited when it's when you're out in the world so that you can adapt quickly and that you can adapt flexibly. To Dr. Libeko, I know this is a very interesting conversation for yourself because you're very research-based and medically-based. So I think uh, one of the key questions that I was asked when I actually attended the Changing Lanes um, uh, NLP course is, what is your purpose? So Dr. Libeko, how do you approach that in your everyday life? What is your purpose? What are you here to do? <laughs> And then, and then we've lost him at this <laughs> this important moment. His network has actually failed us. But Nikki, maybe you can take us a bit through how someone actually finds their purpose. What sort of questions should they be asking themselves? And how does this really link up with, with things like affirmations that you do on a daily basis? OK. okay. Um, um, I think before, before uh, I'm I can't imagine. I think I'm getting feedback. Okay, there we go. We've got the mm -hmm. doctor back. Um, I think that it's important for us to give it back to Dr. Lee Beko because he hasn't had a chance to speak. And actually, whilst you got ladies were talking, and Dr. Lee Beko, um, uh, we lost him. I want you to ask him, I want you to pose a question to him because I think it will be also very good for our audience. For mm. This concept for women is, is so much more trending because it's cool. You know, it's like fluffy stuff almost. What about a guy? Is there any pressure? How, like, I mean, like, how do you guys, how do guys perceive mindfulness? And, and especially yourself, uh, Doc, who's an academic and a 
researcher and because that's how we trained conventionally in medical school right you have to be diligent you have to be focused you have to it's almost like you have to get up every morning and you have to put on your jacket and you it's that way but now this mindfulness stuff and it's it's a little bit out the box and it's a little bit floaty <laughs> and it's girly like yeah give me some feedback on that <laughs> okay um thank you very much uh, nikki and dr lamont so i'll start with uh, nikki um i, I don't have um, an accurate answer to 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 the question but um for me personally um i'm about organization i'm about you know um what is the reality of what's what's going on you know what is the practicality of the space that i'm in so um i've got um you know my wife is more of like you know an emotional person how do i feel how do i you know that kind of thing um i'm more of you know what needs to be done have we done this is it complete well where are we going so and i think that comes from many many years of you know scientific experimentation it's it's for me it's about the pra practicality of what we want to do and whether it's doable or not you know and um, whether i feel like i don't want to do it it's not the issue the issue is it has to be done <laughs> so we have to do it so it's a bit of a you know and and i think because of that disparity in personalities we have we have to navigate the space that we operate in as a family and um you know and we need to find that balance and i i always try and tone down in terms of how practical things have to be and uh, you know and it, you know it's it's that space so but in a nutshell i don't think i have a proper answer to to that in terms of you know mindfulness and and and, and, all, and all that so mm -hmm. and then coming to dr lamont's uh, question with regards to you know what is your purpose um um yeah so i think for me um my purpose in in life is to touch um lives in a very different way you know i use my academic space um to touch you know lives of the people that i supervise you know uh, the students that i mentor and all that and i believe that mentorship and supervision goes beyond you asking for data and pushing someone to finish their masters pushing someone to finish their phd so i always say to my students before we ask about data how do you feel today and I think that goes a really long way. And I want to give a testimony about that, about um, one of my master's students who got uh, that distinction last year. Um, in their acknowledgments, they specifically wrote like a little you know, um, um, note in acknowledgement. And they will always say, they said, they said it this way. I don't have like, you know, proper words for it, but basically what he said was, you know, thank you, Dr. Lebeko for always coming to my desk and kneeling down and saying how do you feel and i think it's more of for me how i look at my supervision is more of i want to serve you and i want to make sure that you get your stuff right and i want to make sure that i put you through you know your masters your phd your honors and mm -hmm. in that way that for me is service to the people that i'm around you know and i believe that i don't have um i'm not a person who's a very a highly social person so i believe in touching lives individually so that's why i use the spaces uh, like in supervision and in close friendships to touch people's lives and to go all out for you know whether it's mm. my friends whether it's my my peers and all that so that's how i see pep my purpose in life you know and one thing that i tell myself uh, is any space that i'm at whether it's an institution and i'm a postdoctoral fellow or whether it's a company and I'm employed in that space, or whether it's a lab where I'm a student, when I leave that place, people should not say anything negative about me, but they should always mm. remember me for being a humble person who is, who's always willing to help. And I think that's the purpose for me. And I, thus far, I've really got that right. And uh, yeah, that's basically that. That's absolutely um, beautiful, Ribs. Wow, that's amazing. Over to you, Nikki. I'm so excited. Uh, Dr. Lebeko, you have to you have to do the Changing Lanes workshop. It is, you're gonna love it. It is so, so, so beautiful. It's such an, 
you know, it's it, you, so often we get onto these what are webinars and streams, and we don't really get to know each person individually. So I think mm. the golden thread here um, and uh, is that every single one of us on this panel um, have a similar purpose. And coming back to your question, Kim, that you asked me before I quickly diverted back to <laughs> Dr. Lebeko, uh, was how do we discover what our purpose is? And I think mm. that the thing is that it's innate. You just know. You know the thing that sets your soul alight. You know the thing that gives you joy. And um, like for me, it's also touching people's lives. It's sharing this information. I know that I've been so blessed to be able to travel and to learn and to acquire all these skills. And there's so many people out there that just have not had that opportunity. And I mm. want to, and, and you know, so for me, it's like giving information, helping people, unlocking them and, you know, getting them to realize, mm. hey, you know what, we are programmed human beings. We, we receive mm. 8 billion information per second which we delete distort mm. and filter down to a few thousand bits and we just like there's so much stuff to know um but yeah i think that you know your purpose uh, the way that i do it i actually have a technique that i teach students uh, because you know very often and especially when they're uh, studying or, or, or making a huge life shift or life change like for example heidi uh, very successful in the fashion industry and then um um some stuff happened and she you know and she's think like a sorry Heidi I'm just sharing your <laughs> your story here. but that was a profound time in her life where she needed to sit back and say like okay like like what is my purpose like 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 mm. where am I what am I what am I doing what am I grateful for so mm. I call it the questions and I don't ask it so that my mind because our mind can our self-talk can quickly pull up things remember we are programmed from birth we are programmed, mm -hmm. I, will, I always use this analogy, and please forgive me, all the Indian people out there, but I always say, I grew up in an Indian home, so if I, I mean, I'm now developing a whole artistic side to me, but back in the day, that was nothing you could say. You had to become a doctor, a lawyer, or uh, an accountant, because that's what needed to happen. Uh, mm. Why? Because that's just how it was. Now, at 35 years old, I've now, kind of tapping into my whole art um talent or i don't know whatever you want to call it and and it's and it's so exciting so i think we're consistently mm. discovering what our purpose is but i think the mm. great purpose for everybody is service to humanity serving each other if you know there's a golden thread between science and i know this is a touchy subject but religion too and and in in every great person whether it was Chris Barnard and his heart surgery, or whether it was mm -hmm. uh, Buddha that taught the people to meditate, or Jesus that that just was amazing. Whatever mm -hmm. it was, it was always people that were of, of service that we look mm -hmm. towards, that we want to be mm -hmm. like, like Nelson mm -hmm. Mandela, he was a cause beyond himself. So I think that that is a, that is a, a golden thread. That, that goes through through humanity because even just if your purpose is to be a mother, you are in service. You are mm. raising a soul. If your purpose is to be a teacher, you are in service. If your purpose mm. is to be a cashier, you are in service. Mm -hmm. Whatever mm -hmm. you do, you are in service. So we have to do it with empathy, with love, with mindfulness in a contemplative fashion because that is what brings about wholeness. Coming back to what mm. I said earlier, uh, you know, health is looked upon, like when we say, okay, what does health mean to you? The, the, the unconscious conditioning immediately goes back to health is the absence of disease. No, health is mm. wholeness. Mm. And, when, mm -hmm. and, we, and when we feed ourselves mindfully, when we feed our mind, our body, our, our environment mindfully, it, it, it's just such a beautiful dance. I want to be a little bit scientific because I like that too. I am actually left brain by all the tests, but I'm not. <laughs> um, um, what was I going to say? Okay, so um, let's take, for example, um, okay, let me just rather tell you because for me to explain it's going to take time. Go and Google Dr. Bruce Lipton. Um, he is, he worked on the Human Genome Project. He has pioneered um 
a, a little movement or a little bit, um, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. He writes a book called The Biology of Beliefs. You can probably download his YouTube of it. Every single cell in your body has memory. Um, mm. And in, you know, he, he stumbled upon that fact or he, he, he had a shift. He had a spiritual awakening, if you want to call it that, when he discovered in a lab that previously people thought that the nucleus controlled the cell. And he realized that the cell wall actually influenced the nucleus. Am I saying it right, Dr. Kim? You like should know yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, no, you, you are, you are. <laughs> that, was, that was like profound. Why? Because our environment has a direct influence on us, on our mm. health. It's not, mm. it's not just, oh, if you've got, sorry, someone's shooting out and I didn't close it off. It doesn't just matter if you're if you've got diabetes in your family, you're gonna get it. No, if your mm -hmm. mother had cancer, you're gonna get it. No, no, you you are in. You can be mindful. You can yes, maybe you're predisposed, so you can take precautions. But it's mm -hmm. what you feed yourself ultimately determines your reality. Um, I know mm -hmm. we got a little bit of time, so anyway, I'm gonna hand it back over to Heidi because she yes. brings a beautiful personal experience to it and then i think we just round table a conversation because i just want everybody to learn i'm so excited yeah, yeah. thanks nikki so you know I, I also there's also been studies and what they've actually done is they've they've taken um buddhist monks and they've actually from a scientific point of view they've they've done f mri scanning on them um in terms of to prove so they would make them so if you're thinking about something that hasn't so if you're thinking about something that's happened in the past or something about happening in the future when when they do those brain scans it actually lights up like it's really happening to you so even though you're in the past or in the in the future your brain is perceiving it that it's actually happening so mm -hmm. the the scientific proof is there in terms of being mindful, you know, the neurologist and um, the the neuroscientists have studied this. They've done the brain scans to see how the different areas of the brain lights up when they, you know, they've done it where they've asked people different questions. They've put them in different scenarios. So from a scientific point of view, the science is there, which is really, really phenomenal, great, actually, because there always needs to be, something needs to be measurable. So it's, for me, it's re I find it absolutely amazing. And I, I was speaking to um, Krishna, and she's from Neurozone, um, and they, they're all neuroscientists and neurologists that have, have done these tests, and they, they run a program as well. And it's, it, it just blows my mind that the scientific proof is there to show you that mindfulness has a huge impact on your body. Um, it has a huge impact on your environment, the way you perceive things, the, the way you you do things. So it's such an important practice to to not, you know, not only for grown-ups to be taught, but even for children from a young age to to be taught that. And I, I have two sons and um, you know, so they the, my my one son will always, and Nikki knows, my oldest son will always go like, Oh mom, are you trying to NLP me again? I'm like, no, darling, think about the words you're using. And yeah. um, this this afternoon, actually, my boys were having a little bit of a, a disagreement and I sent, and I just sent them a message and it was something that Bruce Lee had said. And um, if you don't mind, I actually, do you, I just actually want to read it. So if you just give me a moment, I just mm -hmm. want to get to it quickly. Oh, sorry. Just give me a second. Uh, and Nikki's actually muted at the moment. I can't unmute her. <laughs> Here we go. So while, Thank you. Whilst Heidi's looking for me, I realized that, that I didn't uh, share the, the, the little exercise that I share with my students to help them discover what their purpose is. I said I ask questions, four soul uh, questions. Um, and uh, they are, who am I? What do I really, really want? What is my purpose? And what am I grateful for? Heidi, have you found your yeah. message? There we go. So I don't, know you, I don't know if you heard what I read. <laughs> no, no, you were frozen as well. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. Um, let me just go to...
Sure. I think the network is really bad because of the load shedding. But what I really like that you've spoken about now, um, Nikki, is what am I grateful for? I know when you went through COVID-19, we chatted throughout and you actually told me that one of the things that got you through that moment was having a gratitude journal. So instead of looking at the negative things that were happening to you at the time, to rather be grateful for the smaller things that you were appreciating, like being able to walk one kilometer rather than 10 kilometers like you could before. So can you also just discuss with us the element of gratefulness and gratitude and how that really can reprogram the mind to a certain extent? Heidi, we lost. Yeah, I think the connection is a bit interrupted. I know she did say she's having load shedding soon, so our network today is not so good for everyone. <laughs> so coming to your question, to answer your question, Kim, um, gratitude actually. There's now a scientific. Um, test, and I think I'm speaking under correction, but I think that it became available or, or was developed through the University of San Diego. I'm I'm not quite 100% sure about it. I've heard these facts probably in 2013, so I have to re-reference it. When you are in a state of gratitude, the vibrational frequency of your body changes such that it creates an environment where, okay. Maybe this is going to sound a little bit too esoteric. Have you ever witnessed miraculous healing? In that, in that moment when miraculous healing, I've witnessed it a lot. I mean, um, I, I, I don't like to bring religion into it, but I'm just going to go out there. I, I grew up in a Christian home, so we were at church all the time, and, and I witnessed it there. And then in my, my studies, I've also witnessed um, chant healing, um, energy healing, sound vibrational healing. And there's no... It's, you know, it's almost like a phenomena. People don't know like how this is happening. The, the specific one that I want to um, refer to is being in a state of gratitude. When you are in a state of gratitude, you relinquish the limiting belief that says you do not have. Whether it is you're not having health, whether it is you're not having money, whether you're not having peace of mind, whether you're not having a harmonious relationship with your partner, whatever it is, in that moment, when you start to think about what you are grateful for, you automatically change your vibrational frequency. Now, that mm. might be a bit too esoteric for some people, but this is a fact. If you go and Google, it's Googleable. That's my new word. I've invented it. <laughs> it's Googleable. You can go and you can you can Google. What are we made of? We're made of atoms. What what is what is an atom? You know, so ideally, that you know, if you do enough research and you if you break down those limiting beliefs that you have had in the past and you focus on you know, the things that are going good in your life and you start holding on to them, it, it changes your mindset. It's like me going from, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I can't, I haven't walked in like a month and, you know, I'm feeling so tired because mm -hmm. I'm not getting exercise to just shifting that belief and saying, I'm so grateful that I could walk a kilometer today. I am so, what are the things I'm grateful for today? And, and yes, COVID, like I said at the, earlier, we know health best. When we are not feeling whole, when there's mm -hmm. an absence of, and for me that was because um, I mean I'm generally very healthy and and all of these things, but I've been traveling between Cape Town and Johannesburg a lot, so I think I was just exposed, and my immune system was 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 challenged because it, it will affect you if your immune system is challenged, and I knew exactly why my mm -hmm. immune system. Was challenged. So coming back to the whole contemplative mindfulness, self awareness. Mm -hmm. And then slipping back into gratitude. Gratitude, it's all part of the same whole. When you are mm. self-aware, you are definitely more gra grateful. And then mm. suddenly, like, I was just grateful for life. I was grateful for health. I made simple, silly things. Like, my son was uh, uh, with me when I was, um, and it was in the, over Christ the Christmas period. And he was, like, very frustrated because he's a teenager. He's 17 years old. And he was like, oh, I kind of ruined his holiday. So, because he, he had to now isolate because he was so exposed to me. And, and so he started 
like telling me, you know, Nick, this is so like not cool. And you know, where did you take off your mask? Where did you expose yourself? You know, because you know, <laughs> I was like, even grateful for that. I'm so grateful that my son can communicate with me, um, and mm. that you know he can say these things to me instead of being like, oh, I'm feeling so miserable, and now he's giving me a hard time. That would have made me feel even more miserable. So gratitude is a is a cool thing. <laughs> Do it. Thanks, Nikki. Um, Heidi, we didn't hear your quote because um, you were frozen at the time. If you'd like to share. You muted. And I'm unable to mute her from unmute her from this end, unfortunately. Okay, I okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, the network in Cape Town seems to be a big problem today. Heidi, can you hear us? I can hear you. I, I think it's every time, every time I go out of the, the live stream, I think it cuts me off. Um, but okay. basically, it was, just, it was just a quote about not speaking negatively to yourself because your body will hear those words and mm. about about what you don't change you choose mm. so what you don't change you choose and if you if you're choosing to to be mindful and that will create a change in itself um, but if you're choosing to to stay for example in a negative space in a head space or an environment um you choosing the, the situation, you need to want to change it. And and there's a there's a, a term in, in NLP that some people don't change until the need is there in terms of until the need for change is greater than the actual situation because sometimes the situation becomes a crutch um, and it's easier to stay in the current situation than to make the change. Um, so it's, it's everything that you do is a choice. It's about um, it's about Nikki. What Nikki was saying about being grateful for the little things. Um, you know, there's there's so much going on around us that we could actually um, go into a negative space about. But it's actually about choosing. It's about choosing differently. It's about choosing the small things to be grateful for. Um, and that's yeah. It's 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 an amazing process. Um, being mindful and actually just working with clients as a coach and, and just actually seeing the change and the shift. And that's one of the biggest things that I love the most about working with my clients is that because you you can't tell anybody anything, they have to come to the realization for themselves. And mm. it's such a beautiful experience when you see that. It's like it is literally like a light switch that goes off and you can see it in their eyes. And it's like that aha moment and you're like, yay! And, and you just you physically see that change. And, and you know, there's so, some of my clients and when I, you know, they, they'll post things and or they'll send me messages. And, and when, you, when you, if you think about the state they were in when they first came to you and the process of working through them, because we're only there as a guide the person that you work with, they do the work. So you're there as a guide to help them through their process. Um, mm. And it's just such a it's such a beautiful experience. It's you know, it's like when you're a doctor and you you're helping a patient. I would imagine mm. that it would be the same. Um, mm. so hundred percent, absolutely, Heidi. I think one of the key things that I'm also picking up from you is self-talk. So let me give you a scenario. You're doing, doing your self-talk. You've got yourself in a positive space. And then you come along to work and someone is just picking a conflict with you. How do you approach that? How do you use mindfulness to actually assist you navigate your way? So that's, it's, it's actually, it's all about a state of mind. And mm -hmm. um, my work colleagues are like, Heidi, they're always like, my, my, my one work colleague, she's like, Heidi, you always only see the best in people. She goes, you have to start seeing the other side. And I'm like, but my natural state is not programmed to, to see that. So um, mm -hmm. we have a, a colleague that's, that's quite challenging, but it's about, it's almost about thinking 
what is driving them to be like that? Why mm. are they behaving in a certain way? And it's not about you. It's not about taking it personally. It's about they might be experiencing something in their own personal lives. Um, something could have happened. Something's happening at home that nobody's mm. aware about. And the mm. way they approach that, you know, they, they, you know, they could lash out at you. So mm -hmm. my answer to that would be that not to take it personally and to actually just stop. And that's a it's a beautiful technique. I actually I learned from it's one of from one of Deepak's talks. It's about stop. So literally actually stopping, taking three deep breaths, observing the situation, and then proceeding with love and kindness. So mm. it's it's always it's always a good process to actually try and remain calm in a situation and let somebody else speak. Because the other situation that happens that if, if you react in an aggressive manner when somebody's already in an aggressive manner, it just escalates the situation. But when mm. you're actually, you, you remain calm and you allow them to go through what they're going through and say, um, I understand that you're frustrated right now, um, mm. but, but how can I help you? Or how can we look at the situation? Or how can we solve the situation? Mm -hmm. so it's about yeah. it's really about it's about your self-control because we're mm. all in control of ourselves mm. and also just being mindful of what other people might be going through that you're not aware of mm -hmm. i remember yeah. when i've just started my nlp training with nikki as well a few weeks ago is one of the key things that came up is that people are not their behavior and that there's always a root cause as to why someone is acting in that particular way. So if you can find the root cause, you then definitely know how to approach them and to approach them in a non-judgmental or in a sympathetic way. So I completely yes. agree with that. Dr. Lipeko is gone again. I was about to ask him to read the comments. So we have quite a few comments from the audience today. It's been... A, a topic that people are super interested in. So I'll just pick a few. From Reginald, he's actually said here that Ayurvedic medicine covers all these areas of integrative health, which has been in India for over 5,000 years. Now modest, modern medicine is actually becoming aware of this. Do you want to comment a little bit about that, Nikki? Yeah, sure. So I'm very uh, privileged to um, uh, study some Ayurvedic uh, self-care and medicine at the uh, Chopra University in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Dr. Chopra, everybody knows him. He's very famous for bringing from India all of the, the, the gold in terms of these ancient um, methods of um, just being contemplative practices, if you want to call that. We label it now in this modern developed world as that. There in, in, in India, in terms of Ayurvedic principles, it's self-care. And yes, I agree with Reginald. It's one he's 100 percent correct. And that's why I did mention earlier on in my in my um uh in this webinar, sorry, I mentioned that there's a golden thread that runs through this whole for example, uh, Buddhism, which is not a religion, it's actually a lifestyle. Um, um, Ayurvedic uh, uh, principles, it's also, it's not a religion, it's a, it's a, it's a practice of lifestyle. Uh, yoga is not uh, to be super skinny mm -hmm. and sexy, stuff like that. It's actually an investment in your longevity. It gives you long life. Um, massaging your feet and your body, showering with... Uh, changing the water from hot to cold and giving your body a sensory experiences. Remember, I said every single cell in our body has memory. When we mm -hmm. enhance these processes through self-care, through, for example, Ayurvedic pr principles or contemplative practices, like we're making it known now in the modern world, we are switching on or activating ourselves with love and kindness. Mm -hmm. You know, even just a mindful walk in nature is giving yourself time to commune with creation, that of which you are. So, you know, it, it all interlinks and ties in. So, yes, definitely Google Ayurvedic self-care principles. There's a lot of science in it um, mm. that, uh, you know, America was very blown away by. So they've, they've, they've done mm. a lot of scientific research on, on Indian practices. It's very cool. 
Yes. Let me catch Heidi here before she goes into load shedding. Uh, so there's a statement made from Valia. She says, when the student is ready, the mentor or coach will appear. It's about taking that step on self-responsibility with love. Any comments there? I, I absolutely love that. And that is so, so true. You know, so, some people call that coincidence, but things always happen when they're meant to. And I completely agree with her statement in terms of that when the student is ready, the mentor will appear. I just, I find that so beautiful. It really, really resonates with me. There's often times where, um, like I've had a book on my on my shelf. It's called a Leffy, and it was written by Paolo um, um, Kulo. And I've I've had the book there for for years. And about two years ago, I picked it up and I read that book at the right time for me. So mm -hmm. I do believe that things come onto your path at the right time, and it's mm -hmm. not coincidence. It's it's part of the journey. It's part of your journey. And and it's I just love that it's so so beautiful that when the student is ready the mentor will come. So I completely agree with that. Yeah. So in case I, I go on to load shedding, I just want to say thank you, thank you so very very much for allowing me to be part of this discussion. It's something that I'm really really passionate about. Um, so we can carry on until like in case I just disappear. I haven't just left. <laughs> Thanks so much, Heidi. Now, we're all struggling with connectivity today. It's been quite a challenge, but here we are. We've used our mindfulness. We've started uh, the session. It's gone to 8 o'clock, so I think we're moving in a positive direction. There's another question from the comments as well, where Jay has actually stated, and I think Nikki was speaking about this, feeling down versus feeling high, a shift of vibrational frequency so how do you change your vibration well how do you how do you change your state you change your state by being aware of your thoughts so if you're super high and if it's obviously not externally induced what is what is it specifically that is causing that high is it a thought is it a sensation is it a feeling um mm -hmm. if you are low and it's not externally induced again externally induced by circumstance or whatever how is what you're thinking influencing you because what you think can change your vibration if you mm. are thinking high vibrational thoughts you're going to be in a high vibrational frequency if you're thinking i mean we can just do a little exercise with the audience right now if i tell you at this very given moment think about a time in your life that you were just so excited you were so excited that you just wanted to jump out of wherever you are and shout to the world about something that ex was exciting that was happening. And if you think about it, you will start to experience that excitement. And if I were to tell you to think about something that, you know, think about your most embarrassing moments, you could go there and you could actually start to feel that you could, you might even have a visceral response and you a, a sensory experience and you could see yourself blushing if you were standing in front mm -hmm. of the mirror. Mm -hmm. So you, Yes, high versus low. Um, I recently, well, not recently, it's about two years ago now, I went on this 10-day uh, silent meditation, a silent retreat. And you get there and it's like um, guys stay in one place and women, you don't see each other and you're all covered up. It's like a monastery. It was beautiful. You, it, in a simple setting, you don't talk, you can't write, you can't do anything. You're just in silence and you're meditating for 10 and a half hours a day. And the whole point of that um, is... Just, I'm going to pause it there for a second and go back to meditation. Remember I told you meditation in the conventional terms is like, oh, you know, not thinking. Mm -hmm. It's allowing the thoughts to flow and not judging it. Because only your judgment of it creates a visceral response. If you do not judge it, you remain neutral. And the ultimate for me, uh, you know, I, I, I often read up on um, different uh lifestyle practices, Buddhism, um, Judaism, Christianity, all of those things. And, and for me, the ultimate point of, of, no, I wouldn't say enlightenment, I'd say peace, bliss, balance, is being neutral, is being in a state of neutral, not looking at something and saying, I want more than this, or I want less than this, but just being happy with where you're at. And it's not because we're programmed mm -hmm. into it, because we are sold what works, 
because we are told that we need to be skinny to be beautiful because we are told that we need to drive the fanciest car to make an impression or i don't know whatever the case is whatever whatever society because that's what we conditioned i mean uh, sleeping beauty um was rescued by a prince and he took her off into on a horse into a castle so what you know so we programmed all the time in terms of what to expect but when we have no expectation we can have a desire but when we have no expectation we're in this state of neutral that for me is a nice vibrational frequency to be at because what mm -hmm. goes up must come down and what goes down must come up so at mm -hmm. one point you know like yeah i don't know i hope that kind of um <laughs> um speaks to what jay um had to say yes thanks so much nikki one of the things that you also taught me while we were doing our nlp practice is that you need to calibrate your behavior so you can't be incongruent you have to have your behavior being congruent with your thoughts and I think this also really makes sense from a medical setting that you have to pick better choices, better choices in terms of what you eat, better choices in terms of moving around so that you actually feel better throughout the day. So one of the comments that have been made today from Valia as well is that willingness is key. Heidi, do you want to comment on that? Yes, yeah, sure. It's about... It's what I, what I spoke about previously. It's that the change comes from within. Mm -hmm. And if you're willing to, to make the change, um, it will happen. And it's also, I was speaking to a friend um, many, many years ago, and she, she said to me, and, and this was about actually about losing weight or about anything. It all starts in your mind. So until you, your mind shifts, there and the willingness is there to hmm. I think Heidi's now eventually had her load shedding. Uh, load shedding. It's the, I'm back. Okay. <laughs> um, it's, that, it's that it's that saying of you can take the horse to the water but you can't make a drink. Mm. So mm. once the willingness is there, anything is possible. Mm, mm. Yeah. Let me see what other comments are there from everybody, just making sure that I've covered everything. Oh, one other comment that was made, and I think this was for Dr. Lebeko, but he's not on anymore, is that yes, in service, you have to be in service to yourself, but in service to humanity as well which is one of the threads that we've all discussed thus far um, this evening, actually. I think in the profiles that I read for both Nikki as well as Heidi, is that you want to touch lives in any way that you can, and you want to improve other people's lives for the betterment, not just of yourself, but for others as well. So that's absolutely beautiful. I will read one more comment, and then we'll start to wrap things up. Uh, Valia has also said that weight is an unnecessary baggage that we carry for ourselves and others or all others. Any comments, ladies, in terms of, of carrying that baggage? I know we all sometimes have self uh, problems with self-image and uh, how we look and how much we weigh, particularly the ladies. So this is the point that Valia has actually made, that this sometimes is an extra added baggage. So how can we shift the way people think about themselves and view themselves? Thank okay, you. I think I'm going to jump in there. So, yes, I totally agree with Valia. You know, I think when you become more self-aware and you become more grateful for all that you are, you automatically change the relationship you have with self. And food, because it's an external, it, you know, when you consume food, it, there, there are chemical processes that start to occur in the body because of the digestive process and based on what's in the food and how your body reacts to the food. So you can get a high from eating. And sometimes people self they, 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 they for lack of a better word, I'm going to say medicate with food. They, they try to make themselves feel better with food. And 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 that's not a bad thing. But if they can be self-aware and that they can and and they can identify that, then they can change that. Again, coming back to the willingness to to uh, the self-awareness and all of those things. 
Um, so yeah, I hope that that answered that. <laughs> I, I would also just like to make a comment there, and um, yeah, it's a it's a very it's a very heavy bag that they're carrying around um, because it's you know weight and the way we look. It's it's so socially pushed it's in your face all the time instagram facebook um netflix um, movies you know so for some people it's really really is um you know it's it's really challenging for them and the shift doesn't happen that quickly because it's actually it's a complete mindset change that has to occur for them because once the mindset changes they then also view themselves differently. And it's it's often, you know, it's about when you look in the mirror, how do you see yourself? And for people who have that challenge, it's actually, it, it's not something that happens overnight, but it's, it's about them getting a better understanding of who they are for them to change their perception of themselves. So, yeah. Mm. So there it comes back to, again, self-talk, communicating with yourself, appreciating yourself, not judging yourself, which makes it easier then for you not to judge others as well. So it ties it back into what the conversation was about this entire evening. So thank you so much for that, ladies. I don't know if there's any closing remarks from Nefreti followed by Heidi before we close the evening tonight. Well, thank you everybody for taking the time to listen. I hope that we served in some way to switch on a light or plant a seed or just intrigue you um, in some way or the other. Um, and yeah, I think that um, mindfulness is, is, is something that should be taught in schools. It is critical to wholeness. Um, so yeah, <laughs> have a wonderful evening. I just, I just also would like to thank you, Kim, um, for allowing me to be part of this conversation. It's, um, it's been really amazing, and hopefully, somebody has shifted, and you know, the student has found their mentor through our discussion, and there has been a change. So, um, if anybody would like help on their journey, we're, we're all here to to assist. So, and yeah, thanks everybody for listening to our, our discussion and have a, a beautiful evening further. Thanks so much, Heidi. So if anyone would like to contact Heidi, she's available at Unique Purpose and Nefreti is available at Changing Lanes. I'm currently Nefreti student with my NLP course that I'm doing at the moment. So I'm very excited that both Nefreti as well as Heidi could be here today to share um, knowledge that I believe to be so valuable in shifting oneself and, and dealing with plenty of things that are happening in the world at the moment, so changing your perspective. So I think one of the key things that I'd like to close with today is it really comes from the spirit of Ubuntu. I am who I am because of who you are. So thank you so much for touching my life and thank you for touching other people as well. It's been an absolute pleasure to have both of you here with us tonight. Thank you, ladies. Have a good evening.